Hello, your photographer and narrator, Fred Rackle. It's almost a month following the Kilauea eruption, and we have signs of activity about 30 miles further along the Kilauea Rift, which is laced with the underground plumbing from Kilauea. Much of the sparsely populated Puna area had been suffering earthquakes and tremors all through early January. It's here in sleepy Pahoa town that our volcano drama unfolds. Throughout this area, much ground cracking had resulted from the earth tremors, and which were being recorded and plotted at the volcano observatory further up the slope. Here almost in the center of town is a large ground crack running right along Main Street. Yours truly inspects this for signs of heat or steam, but no evidence. A volcanic eruption had been expected somewhere in Pune, but of course no one could have been pointed exactly where it would start. Well, on the evening of January 13th, it did start only 300 yards to the rear of Kapoho town. A one mile long rift had split the valley floor and was pumping molten lava 50 to 100 feet into the night sky. Along almost the entire length of the rift line, we're a full mile southeast now along the uh, rift and finding this low but forceful lava flow rolling along the valley floor, heading for the sea some five miles distant. This is a pahoehoe flow, indicated such by its speed, and carries along with it the partially cooled broken off slag. The flow is moving about two miles per hour, more or less, depending on the slope of terrain, Back at the rift line, we see increased height as the lava is now blasting to about 200 feet in this one section. Occasionally, there are more explosive bursts that are going off like bombs, very spectacular to involve, to observe closely up. Up she goes, wow, how about that? <laughs> the steady fountaining is lowering a little at the left end of the rift, and it appears that the force is gaining on the right where most of the bursts are higher and the cone is growing larger with many blobs splashing down, will become the center of the volcano over the next few days. Back at the flow heading, we see lava pouring into a gully area on its route along the valley floor. At this point, the flow is about a half mile in width and passing over farmland and toward orchid fields and the Warm Springs vacation area some two miles further. This is the hardy Ohia brush burning, though much of the flame is from the methane gas emission from buried vegetation. This is quite a large gully and so will take a large volume away from the flow, filling deeper and deeper. More of the methane flames now leaping from the ground in advance of the rolling lava fired by the high heat and coming now directly toward us, but fairly safe to photograph as the forward speed is not that great. Just so we don't trip over ourselves moving back. Oops. <laughs> now we're warned by shouts that the flames are jumping behind us, so we have to grab our equipment and move fast. Oh boy. And establish another position. Early the next morning, we have much pleasure to discover a new phenomenon. The right side of the rift line is belching forth with tremendous volume of jetting steam. The lava underground had tapped into a water source below Warm Springs and boiling the water to cause this steam eruption. A most spectacular sight. Seen from the coffee fields here at the sides of the rift line, the steam is rising explosively thousands of feet into the sky and some of this matter will be carried by the upper winds clear over to Oahu, even to Kauai, and where the people simply term it volcano weather. Most spectacular, what tremendous force for photographing a true rarity of volcanic activity. Take a walk up on the hill now, just above town where we get a better view showing the farm fields in the foreground, panning slowly to the left, noting that the fountaining had stopped at that side. With all the force now being at the right side, where all that blasting steam had been rising. The 
the center of the growing cone, which shows a pretty golden color in the morning light, here about 300 feet, and we look by telephoto lens right into the center of that fast rising mass. Up and up she goes, a blinding scene. If you hadn't seen this proceeding, you'd hardly recognize this as lava, would you? From the air now, we can become better oriented. The town in the lower foreground, the beautiful productive farm valley to the rear, with the many truck farms, the row of the town stores to the lower left, and the growing volcano threatening the existence of it all. Back on the ground, from the hill just above the stores, we see this more clearly. Only 300 yards away through papaya fields, orchid farms, yours truly up on the flow siding, shooting at the fountaining lava and the cinder cone. It's hard enough up there, don't worry. We're taking close-ups once again, right into the raining lava. We call this scorching close-ups, then backing off of the flow, Move carefully up here so you don't trip and uh, <laughs> get in trouble. We find some uh, curious tourists here who had somehow got past the civil defense people, keeping the public out of the area. They're poking at the flow heading with sticks. One of them here gets a hot foot. How about that? They're leaving through a papaya grove there that's soon going to be destroyed. At night, we're seeing quite a change in size and a giant new lava flow glowing and fanning out over the older flow, not clearly seen here from the air. From the ground later, much higher yet, and we estimate 1,200 feet, this being a new threat because it could seek new direction from the older flow. We're seeing the new giant here from the other side of the valley, silhouetted by a row of pretty cocoa palms, which are yet quite far from the heat, but they'll be doomed as a new heavier flow approaches. Makes a beautiful picture, doesn't it? Orchid plants are being evacuated by the thousands from the fields of the Hongo Orchid Farm as the lava flow approaches. Most of the crop is saved. Not so as Mr. Hongo's house as it becomes one of the first farm home victims of this eruption. This is a flank movement of the flow and not very fast, but the advance can't be stopped, and so the home burns. Bulldozers are called to work, pushing together earthen dikes in attempt to divert the coming lava flow and save the warm springs of resort land from destruction. Interestingly though, this type action can cause legal arguments, for just maybe the lava is diverted to someone else's land, huh? This is the same flank movement as destroyed the Hango Hongo land, and again not moving very fast, but it does push on into the area. It does overrun the dikes and on into the springs. Next morning we're at the road junction looking at the visitors bureau marker that had directed many visitors to that recreation and vacation playland. Too bad. From the air again, and looking at the very wide scope of this Kapoho lava flow, the town lies just on the far side of the scene and is just high enough and upwind enough that the town had not yet been destroyed, except for the cinder fallout. Lava enters a sea along a wide front, boiling the ocean water, killing fish in the reef areas. This is how the islands have grown geologically to keep creating new land that is new shoreline and will be added to the future maps. Here's another photographer, my good friend Gordon, with whom I've worked together at other volcanic eruptions. Now we look closer back up on the hill above town. We see an increasingly dismal sight. Though the town itself has not yet been covered by lava flows, it has been hit hard with cinder, thrown high by this now giant fountain. And with a new height and fallout threatening, Every bulldozer in the area is mobilized to build the highest dike yet attempted in an effort to change direction of the expected overbearing flow from the vent. The valley floor now has flows over flows 
and all that volume could create a new, heavier flow to come in on the town from the side. We see at night this beautiful but threatening fountain at 1,500 feet, and it is now throwing forth a heavy new flow coming directly in toward the town and the newly constructed dikes. Now it's rolling over the dikes and moving in on us. There's no hope for our village now as we see the high wall of lava moving in on our flank into the backyards of the town, here into shed and chicken hatching areas behind Bourne House. This is to become a night of terror for the people, most of whom had been evacuated by civil defense workers. Many of the backyards are first to burn, then into housing. Several other photographers and news people are here to record this momentous event. Over 20 homes and stores are to be burned by lava in this one evening. This is a record-breaking eruption in number of homes and productive farm properties destroyed. Look at that giant lava fountain, only 200 yards to the rear, pumping away with volume that appears will never stop. You'll notice in some scenes firemen pouring water onto the burning homes, almost looking like they're trying to put out this giant volcano. Well, no, they're under orders to keep the house's hoses going enforcing regulations that direct continual effort to save any and all property. Does seem a little silly though, doesn't it? More houses burn with the firemen not giving up and the lava moves down Main Street. Besides from the rear and the impact of the flow is overwhelming, another home goes as the fountain pumps on, feeding this destructive lava flow. Here's the town garage and service station certainly not much of service now. Note the ironic no smoking sign, aha. Yours truly had the distinction of rescuing a little calico colored kitten from this house just before the burning. It was terrified and clung with claws to my jacket. Yet another house goes up in flames as we watch and record all of this drama on film for posterity. What a night of terror this has been. Lava moons up, moves on up the hill, which slows it down a little, but it gets there. These two-story buildings are fired an hour later. We hadn't thought the lava would come this high, but as flows overran flows and lava filled the lower area, it had to go somewhere. These five two-story buildings are destroyed in one hour as we watch. As we filmed this area, by the way, we were being bombarded with heavy cinder and lava bombs thrown over by the now closed fountain. Got pretty scary for a while. By morning, we'll see now what very little is left of this once pretty little town. Just the few remaining stores that we see, looking down from the cinder covered hillside, and this Shell Station store. As we pan to the right, there's nothing left of the rest of the village. The town has been buried under the lava flow except for this one little house at the edge of the now hardened flow. We wonder if it was saved by those firemen. The fountain rose, roars on and look at the broad base now, almost as wide as it is high, putting out more and more volume as the days go on. Bulldozers are out again and still trying to fool Madame Pelly by building dikes in attempt to change her lava flow routes. The flow is covering new land just south of where Warm Springs was buried a few days before. And now the property of the U.S. Coast Guard Station is threatened. You'll notice the lava flow has no regard for the keep out sign. <laughs> On we go across the road and panning further across the field. The flow is starting a new southerly direction covering land that we not thought would be so effective. Road junctions and mileage markers are hit, and yours truly is having a ball skipping around the outskirts of the lava, getting good scorching close-ups of the different parts of the flow. And I'd sort of forgot where we'd left our rental car. Someone shouted, I looked around and there I found it, ha ha. Let's move that vehicle or we'll have an exploding gas tank. Got a little careless there, but it did make a little excitement to the uh, film, didn't it? 
The lady principal of this country's school is having conference with civil defense officials concerning the flow movement in this direction, and it's decided to have the bulldozers try another diversion. But not enough dozers are available, and the dikes are too low. They're ineffective. Lava builds higher on the other side, forming like a lake, breaks through and over the hastily constructed dike, pouring into the schoolyard and toward the building. From inside the schoolhouse, the principal looks at this wall of lava approaching. This lady was a child student in this same schoolhouse, later a teacher, then principal. This really must be hard on her. There's no stopping this vault luminous fool now as it moves across the end and in upon the schoolhouse, touching it off, and soon the school is burning. Gone now, leaving only the remains of twisted lava-covered wreckage. Back at the Kapohoachin, we're seeing this lone planter's house at the upper end of the valley, and we have now a new outbreak at the base of the huge cone. This is pouring a large volume of Pahoehoe lava onto the west end of the valley, which till now had only been affected by fallout of cinder and ash. If this keeps up, we'll have new lava flows forming at the southwest end of the valley, and more of the outlying farmers' homes will be threatened. With sugar cane here to the left side, the lava moves in on papaya fields and pours first into one of the pre-eruption earth cracks. This should dissipate some of that volume of the flow, huh? We wonder how far down it'll go. On further into the papaya fields and wrapping around the hairy plants before destroying same. The planter's home burns and my good friend Gordon is again recording on film this destructive action. All of this land will be recovered soon. The tree rides in the flow which is moving around toward town, toward the other farmhouse that we saw earlier. Further yet we see the flow, the forceful figure of lava moving over the cinders toward the yet untouched end of the Poe town, stopping here to fire another planter's house, burning it as we watch. Yours truly moving in here for a picture, and that home is gone. Visitors are now permitted into a cordoned area around the uh, once busy storefront where not much is left. But this is now a scene of activity as that small lava flow is moving toward the area from above. It's hard to believe the store owners hadn't taken their possessions out before this. But here they are, still moving out. The water tank truck here is uh, feeding the fire hoses of the firemen yet doing their duty, trying to save property. Again, it seems silly, but that's their orders. To the right rear of that Filipino store, they're working hard to cool the lava as we see the huge force continuing close to the rear, wetting down the storefront. Watch here now as that uh, top collapses. Wow! The firemen go nonchalantly back to work. Coming closer around the side now, just look at that giant fountain to the rear. The firemen have to finally give up though as the store finally burns to the ground. The sun is obscured by smoke and fumes and has a weird appearance considering it's midday. The fountain appears ever higher and we're growing suspicious and fantasize that it might go on forever with the output and maybe even bury the island. Some of the high flow siding touches in on the Young Buddhist Association School. Firemen have once again been trying, but again failing, as the school is now destroyed. At night, the fountain is higher yet to an estimated 1,500 feet and extremely wide at the base. Most beautiful, but awesome. From the hill above town, we can see a new channel of output sending a fast-moving Pahoehoe River down the center of the flow. We're over a mile out now upon the semi-hardened main flow, with this lava river moving at about 10 miles per hour. 
This is a force that is beneath the main flow, pushing and spreading the flow heading onward closer yet into a section of the channel. Like a blast furnace here, we have to move back after only the short spell with the high heat. Here's the flow heading which is much slower and much higher, about 15 feet at this point. But this is a relentless force that reaches out to do damage to anything in its past. We look closer directly at this wall of molten rock that in another minute will be moving over where we are, now standing. We'd better move, huh? The relentless flow moves in through a grove of tall cocoa palms pushing some over with the force and destroys the Coast Guard Lighthouse Station grounds and the personnel quarters, of which we'd seen the entrance earlier. Then into the sea once again, threatening more new land. Watch here for a tremendous explosion and note this, that this is how black sand beaches are created. We're on the coast looking north to the advancing flow, but we'll become airborne for the next scene to explain a new development. Look back to the fountain five to six miles inland and follow the wide lava flow to the sea. The ocean-cooled lava has formed its own giant dike and is curved around to come down the coast directly toward the Tapoho Beach Lots, subdivision of about 30 homes. Let's go back to the fast-moving river in the center of the wide flow for better detail than we could see that night. This again is the Pahoyhoy center of the two-mile-wide lava flow. It is 10 miles per hour in speed, but which becomes less evident as nearing the flow heading. For it is a force that spreads beneath the entire flow and keeps it moving. It is very dangerous to be close to, and at this point we had to back out fast. We're looking down the same river toward the sea about two miles distant. This is still the flow that we're on. The whole mass is molten below and is moving. The lava flow along the coast is rolling over the walls of the beach lot homes and moving in on some of the properties. This house still being evacuated, the occupants having waited till the very last minute. Many people just refuse to believe that they'll be hit until they see it 50 yards close. Most of the homes have beautiful fish ponds and gardens, and as the relentless lava moves on through, uncaring of the surroundings, we can't help but think, what a terrible waste. A section of the low heading shows the average speed, which is considerably safe to walk away from, and it is a, -a lava, being of the uh, rough crumbly type. Here steam rises as lava enters one of the fish ponds. The water boils, many of the carp and other kinds of tropical fish are killed. That beautiful home we saw a short time back being evacuated is now being destroyed. Lava continues to press over the walls from the sea and moves here into the Sammy Miura house. Sammy was well known, had a bar in Pahoa, was a friend of all us photographers. Another home burns as the flow hits it and moves on. Looking across this row of fish ponds, we see through the steam another house being approached by lava and note the firemen, for the first time this day, doing their duty as they see it. Another home goes as the action moves on. In this one morning, 16 of the properties were burned and buried. Madame Pelly had again been on a destructive rampage. Back at the cinder cone area, we note that the fountain is somewhat lower, and there are now two small fountains pumping out from the base of the cone into the upper valley at the west end of the crater, where those papaya fields were earlier, and where the several farm homes had been destroyed. This is high volume for such a small fountain, and pouring here right out toward our camera. The fast-moving river pushing more of the highly fluid Pahoy Hoy out onto the lake, now trapped in this upper valley. This outbreak has taken the force off of that running toward the ocean and the beach lot homes, and because of the terrain it has almost nowhere to go. 
The giant cone blocks all that new lava from running toward what had been downhill, and huge high flows that had wiped out Capo Town block the mass from each side, so it forms a lake in this upper valley and just spreads out wide. Look at this slithering mass coming in on us now. The entire flow surface becomes a massive collection of these little lava falls, very pretty to observe and we think the eruption is almost ending for the volume is lessening and we see the fountains more red than yellow indicating lesser temperature and the higher cinder cone appears to be breaking down in sections and the falling lava is more like bombs wet and heavy as it seems to tear the cone apart it's really pounding hard on that rim this is to be the last night of eruption for come daylight the fountaining at the base is stopped and the little fountaining of the main cone is dying down fast. Only an occasional burst is seen spattering forth. Returning now to the hill area, we look upon the row of dismal store remains, with little left to either side. Let's look at a flashback replay of this area at the start of eruption, a scene of tranquil beauty, but with disaster imposed by the giant eruption only 300 yards distant in the backyard. Back to the reality of what's left now, from that remains to the left and panning to the right, the town of Kapoho has been buried beneath this mountainous lava flow and the beautiful productive farm valley completely inundated in this six weeks of devastating volcanic activity. This is the end of our film. Thanks for looking and listening. Your photographer and narrator, Fred Rackle.